Hey everyone, uh, I'm B, the DM of the Frostwalkers podcast. Uh, you're probably wondering why I'm introducing myself so weirdly. Um, this is a very special uh, episode, it's not even a real episode of the show. A few weeks ago, my two great friends, uh, Spyglass Realms, who runs the podcast Starhopper Radio and is soon to be uh, the DM of the Escape Artists, and Lance, uh, who runs the amazing 20 Sided Adventures podcast, um, who's also the, the man behind Sito, uh, sat down and had just a fun chat about all things DMing. We had some questions from people on the Frostwalker server. Um, and we're hoping to make this a bit more regular of a thing. Um, just something where we can sit down, talk, and mostly detox. I also apologize for the super late recording of this episode. That's uh, I, that's on me. Um, just a lot of personal stuff going on right now, but that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully within some time this week, we'll be doing an announcement about things like a Patreon and coffee in the near future, if you want to support Frostwalkers. I'll also be uh, leaving links to the work of Spyglass and Lance in the uh, <clears throat> in the show notes and uh, promo for 20 Set Adventures will end the episode of 3DMs in a Tavern. <sighs> but without further ado, I'm going to uh, let the music take us away as we enter the Multiverse Cafe and uh, hear the insane ramblings of three dungeon masters in a tavern. God, I hate that voice. <laughs> All right, so yeah, um, That's no real haunt my not nightmares forever. Oh yeah, for sure. Be. No problem. <clears throat> uh, no, no real plan. 
Um, I think so that way we can get them out of our system before we just shoot the shit. Um, we'll start with the things people had the audacity to ask me. <laughs> um, but beforehand, I think maybe. Eh, well, I mean, we know each other, but we know each other, but maybe newcomers might not. Assuming there's initially, if they're listening to one podcast and not the others. That's true. Assuming that there's something people listen to. There's a lot of assumptions being made right now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, for the uninitiated, or maybe just for people answering questions, people who we send the answers to who don't know. Um, I'm B. I'm, I'm running the Frostwalkers, and I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I'm Doug, a Spyglass. Uh, I run um, the Escape Artist, and I also don't know what I'm doing. And I'm Lance, and I run the 20 Sided Adventure Space Days. And I'd say I know what I'm doing, but that would be a lie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good to know we're all on even terms. All right. <clears throat> so there are a few things people asked that I thought were pretty good questions. And I want to just jump into those before uh, I forget them, because I will forget. I am clinically known for forgetting. So the first one comes from a personal friend of mine who goes by Vigno Nebula on Discord, but I know them better as Mocha. Um, and they asked me a few days ago, Hey, sorry to be a bother, but in our D&D group, I called dibs to DM our next campaign, and I honestly have no idea where to start and what I'm doing. Oh, oh, welcome to the club. I was wondering if you have any tips for a first-time DM. <laughs> Trying to make a homebrew. I I stand firm by the belief that a homebrew can be made starting with a pre gen story. Oh yeah, like homebrew is there is no like right way to do homebrew. It's all it, there's a reason why it's called homebrew. Like it's just whatever you decide to do with it, more or less. It's true, and I mean. You're, so I'm, you don't have the predicament. If you're new to DMing, <laughs> if you're new to DMing as a whole, like I am, I would recommend uh, searching stuff out that might be similar. Because I guarantee you, somebody has homebrewed something even marginally similar to what you are thinking of. That's true. Yeah, there's a. So I, like, yeah. Um, I looked up Cybermen stats and I found them. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. Not even surprised. Um, I, um, when I was making the test session for um, my podcast and my crew, um, I was looking for a specific kind of, this sounds weird, but I was looking for a specific kind of moth. Um, and I just looked up moth creatures D&D, &D, and I found uh, what's called a flame moth. Um, and I thought, hey, that's cool, but it's really quite fit with what I have in mind for the theme. So I changed it a little bit, I tweaked it, I gave it some new stuff, and now uh, and it became the um, the temporal moth. So I just changed some stuff around. Uh, and honestly, I kind of winged uh, a lot of the AC. I thought, especially the AC and the um, HP, while I was doing the test session, I had no idea if my players were going to be able to um, to cope with this thing or not to either whether it would kill them or or they would kill it first um so right. i sort of like, like i actually changed the ac of it or i changed the hp of it several times during the fight because i had no idea which way the fight was going and so <laughs> i feel that so oh, it was it was actually um it was on the higher end when our cleric finally decided yeah i'm gonna cast uh inflict wounds and rolled like 21 points of damage. I had a breakdown over this spell. <laughs> he fucking rolled 21 points of damage. A... And I'm just like, holy shit, you murdered this thing. You flat out killed it. If it were a character, it would not have gotten death saves. It would have been knocked straight dead. Oh, no. oh. Wow. Oh god, I was so pissed today. Uh, small side tangent, but that's what this is for. I was playing with my college buddies. We finally set up roll 20 for it and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it was my friend Sal running it, which meant I get my chance to play Janice, you know, the, the yearly affair yes. I get to be a player character. And not only did I get the spell Guardian of Nature, which was awesome, um, 
But on top of that, the fight was against a vampire, and I had Moonbeam, which is a radiant light. And I said, Ooh. I said one sentence that made Sal, my, my friend, my DM, uh, almost leave the call. And that was, well, Moonlight's just reflection of the sun. <laughs> and he was like, You're right, though. His response was, You're not wrong. And I'm like, So if I cast this moonbeam right on him, would he get the damage from standing in sunlight? It's just like, I guess. <laughs> and I was like, Great. By the way, I'm casting. So as like, a DM, yeah, as a DM, I'm going to say my call would be to give him half. That would have worked, yeah. But I think he just thought that the vampire was way too OP. Because we were like level six, and this thing was like full fledged vampire, like yeah, probably like a CR. I don't know. Nine and so something. I just nuked it with moonbeam, and he was like, "All right, he's gonna leave." I'm like, "When you leave the moon," he's like, "I know." When you leave the moonbeam, <laughs> he took the damage again. I'm like, "Cool, bonus action, yoink!" <laughs> and he's just like Bobby. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> And that's the story of how Janice became a vampire slayer by standing there and yoinking a beam of light around. <laughs> that's amazing. It's but fucking I, beautiful. I did the same thing with the uh, the frost worm mm-hmm. from episode one. Uh, I was like, yeah, ice planet, frost worm. That's perfect. Looks up frost worm. Oh my god, this is gonna <laughs> kill them. I mean, like, I mean. The, the normal stats for uh, a Frostworm, like, with its second attack, it was like 8d10 of Whoa. damage. And I'm just like, holy shit, they are gonna die. Let's just nerf this down a little bit. Just take SCP whatever the fuck to it. See, that really is the beauty of being a DM, is it's all it's your true. choice. Yeah. Like, you don't have to you don't, you don't have to subscribe to even other yeah. people's homebrew is you can just it's modular that's the whole point of the game is you can modify it however the hell that's you true. want and sometimes you don't even need a hardcore number sometimes you could just kill the thing when you feel like you they've earned it you know oh, yeah. for example oh, yeah, uh, in the fifth episode of, of frost walkers there was the the first real big boss battle um which was the first tags it's com it's story related and kind of complicated but, like, the Frost Wolf is what I dubbed the thing. The giant thing that was totally not just the frozen boss from Kingdom Hearts. Yeah, I just listened to <laughs> Yeah. A uh, bit day. about that, then. I, I, since I made it up, I, I found a stat block maker at my job during my off time and just started punching in numbers to see what happened for fun. Um, oh. And oh, that's awesome. what I remembered succinctly was thinking, what if I just took a bunch of ice spells I already have memorized thanks to Kalum, made them their attacks, like same damage calculations, same everything, but just called them something different. So their bite was just frostbite, the tail shot was just ice knife, like, because I knew those damage calculations, you know what I mean? And then what ended up happening with their HP yeah. and their AC was I built in a fun thing where someone hit it with fire, their AC would go down because it was made of ice. Like, it's protection would wear enough. I was like, that's cool. And then Shay hit it with Moonbeam, and I was like, it's radiant fire. <laughs> it's close enough. So I counted it. Yeah. And then Leona hit it. was. The thing was, that was Shay, a cool fucking uh, scene, you know how though. right before Rowan that. killed it uh, with Thunderwave, Sari had gotten like a nat 20 with the flurry of blows? That should have done it. That, like, numerics wise, that would have been yeah. the killing blow. But I knew that Rowan was right next on the turn order, and I knew Rowan getting the kill on this thing was such a better story beat. Because that was... So then, like, after the episode, I told... I came oh, Queen to Olivia, yeah. so I was like, look, just so you know, that, that uh, Flurry of Blows should have absolutely killed it, but I just... I really thought Rowan getting the kill was a better story beat. And Livy's response was like, as someone who's DM'd in the past, I agree, you did the right thing. <laughs> and, I, and she's like, I'm surprised you told me. She's like, I'm surprised you told me. I would not have known. 
That's about like, I just felt bad, man, because Sari got a nat 20 and a flurry of blows, and I feel like I completely stole her thunder. She's like, nah, man, Sari got the kill last episode. <laughs> While well, almost dead, with the exact That's same right. strategy. Murder Sorry, Edgar. great because I well, don't need to wonder what she's dead. gonna do. It's punch, flurry, of blows. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I know her plan. It's great. Monks are very fun. Monks are fun in general. Like um, one of my players is playing a monk, and by accident, like um, I actually, I was we were I was working with her on the stat block. Uh, because this is her first time playing, and I accidentally said something like, um, I think I accidentally made reference to eight foot vertical leap, and, and um, she begged me to keep it, and I'm like, okay, fine. And then, uh, so her character canonically has an eight foot vertical leap. And then, when we were doing the, uh, when I was explaining the key stuff, apparently, if you use Step of the Wind, you can, um, you can like double jump height. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, that means, and she goes sixteen foot <laughs> vertical leap. I'm like, god damn it! <laughs> I had no choice. So I played a, uh, I played a monk, and it was actually a homebrew that Kaz had come up with. Uh, it was these tieflings uh, have Earth Genasi heritage, so their horns. Oh, that's are, awesome! Uh, like gemstones. Ooh. And so I had a Why is that the cool? clean monk. I'm just grabbing a notepad really Lila. quick. That's so cool. Eh. Just gonna yoink that. <laughs> She's probably one of the bad like most badass characters I've ever played. But we were doing this campaign and she had gotten uh the DM was like, Hey, you guys get to pick a rare item from this list. And I'm like, huh. I asked him, like, can Lila grab the foldable ship? And he's like, the what? It's a, a rare oh, it's one called, of the, uh, the foldable ship. And what it is, is it's a little so tiny much. box, and you throw it, and you you say uh, a word, and uh, on one keyword, it turns into a small, like, boat. On another word, it turns into, like, a 25-foot ship. And holy so, shit! Holy or shit. holy ship, I should say. And so we were in the middle of fighting these cultists, and Lila climbed up on the roof of this building. Oh my god! And it's just like, hey, motherfuckers! And she's like, eat ship, and she threw the ship <laughs> bus over them and said the word, and it transformed <laughs> into a giant, uh, gi giant ship. And they had to roll a deck save of, uh, I think, 21. And each of them took uh, 10 d20 oh. of damage. Oh, that's so awesome! It was... Fucking legend. Yes, and I will always remember that moment of just her yeeting the ship at her enemies. And then everybody else came out, and there's just this giant ship in the middle of town that flushed, <laughs> like, 30 cultists. It was it was good. That was one of my prouder moments, not gonna lie. So I mean oh. there is so much you can do with like if it's good for the story, let your let your players do it. It could be worth That's it. That's true. Yeah, I mean my honest to god advice for starting up, like a whole new thing with DMing. Honest to God, grab like one of the pay what you want or like really cheap modules off of DM guild. My personal favorite is like Secrets of Skyhorn Lighthouse. Because it's there's so much creepy stuff and stuff that the they wrote for Skyhorn Lighthouse only, like a whole new race of creatures that'll definitely spook them. Uh, mm -hmm. Or even just start with Lost Minds of Fandel. I mean, that's what the Adventure Zone did, and it's a fucking Adventure Zone. <laughs> like, True back. like if the Adventure Zone got away True. from just fucking doing the first mission of Lost Minds of Fandelver, and then it turned into you know balance i think you'll be fine doing anything like that <clears throat> uh, i guess while we're talking on um, terms of modules does anyone have like a favorite pre-written thing that they've ran my personal favorite is dragon heist because oh my god it's so cool 
So, uh, I have no previous DM experience. That's, My that's only fair. experience DMing that's has fair. been a homebrew. Same. So I really could not I say. Have, like we we own uh probably eight books, but. Not That's fair. I mean, <clears throat> my other suggestion would be, uh, I really like, I really like Dragon Heist. Dragon Heist is fun. You, you can use the Xanathar and in the same story, and that blows my mind. Um, <clears throat> Curse of Strahd's a favorite. Everyone likes Strahd. I mean, unless you want to have a fun campaign where no one gets stabbed, in which case, don't do Strahd. <laughs> My only time being a PC in Strahd, uh, there was a TPK. We... Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Was a... There was a TPK. Oh. I thought you because said a TP it was day. Because they like, made it to town. I left. Oh. I had to leave early. I was playing their cleric, so me leaving was problem number one. Uh, but the more egregious problem was because oh. just the way the tarot oh. cards worked, they got the Sun Sword really fucking early. And they had a really overconfident Goliath Barbarian who was just like, we got oh, the no. Sun Sword, and he legit called out Strahd in the middle of Barovia, just like, come and fight me, bitch. And he did. <laughs> yeah, and so Strahd did that. Drax, and then he killed Destroyer all- <laughs> from Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> because Strahd CR 15, and these fuckers were level 2. Holy shit. <laughs> I, uh, when I when I got I left early because I had to, I think I had something to do and when I called later I was like hey Graham how'd the game go everyone died I'm sorry what <laughs> so yeah Curse of Strahd's a good time just don't let your players be stupid <laughs> that's pretty sa sage advice in any circumstance no matter what. Uh, just don't let your players yeah. be stupid. You, you as the DM, have the right to say no. Like that is a thing that you have in your toolbox. Abs of, uh, or as my favorite, absolutely fucking you can not. Say, <laughs> no, I can't let you do that. Yeah, I think I've said absolutely fucking absolutely not a few times. I'm yeah, sure. the more colorful version of it. I think my biggest advice for anybody who wants to start DMing is. Don't try to write out your thing as a story. Write it out as like an outline and bullet points and what you want, like where you want them to go. Because I can guarantee you, absolutely, <clears throat> that they will not do what you want to do. They will find some way to derail it. They will find some person to talk oh, to God. who never created. And oh, believe me, I know. So do not rely on a I story. Have... Rely on bullet mm -hmm. points because they will, they will find a way. And if you don't think you have enough, <laughs> yep. you do. Trust me. Yep. Um, that's the one thing that you really do need to have as a skill as a DM is improv. You need to be able to make shit up on the fly. Because I, um, one of my players in the very first episode of um, the Escape Artists, which will be out soon. Um, our necromancer threw sort of a curveball at me and he wanted to enchant his book and so I had to like spin up an enchanter character on the fucking spot and I think I did okay I mean she's just a minor character but the thing that bugs me bugged me in the moment and bugged me bugs me until now is um, that I said she was of orcish heritage and I'd already established a lot of the lore for orcs in the uh, in, in my world and I picked a name just out of the depths of my brain that was absolutely not orcish in nature abs at all. Like, either D&D &D standard orcs or Adrianic orcs. I just picked, like, I don't know, Alyssa Davis or something like that. And that is the most mundane name for <laughs> uh, a member of a culture. Well, I can sort of explain it away canonically by saying oh maybe she was i mean in all likelihood she was from not from her yeah species yeah. culture but like orcs in adrian are inspired by a like polynesian culture and uh their language is inspired by polynesian language so i take a lot of like 
cues from Mari, and I just came up with Davis on the fly, and I'm like, shit, in my head, as I was saying this, my mouth was moving, and in my head I was going, shit, fuck, I fucked up, shit. <laughs> oh, 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 you want to talk about on-the-fly NPCs with, a, with disastrous implications? Ladies and gentlemen, meet Nephis, the, uh, what, the episode 6 mail carrier for Kishol, who was a half-elf with blue hair. And see, the oh, only yeah. thing I come up with was, eh, she's a half elf, and I'll give her kind of like a rebellious hair look. So I gave her like sort of a punk blue, you know? I thought that'd be neat. And then someone was like, oh, is she yeah. and Andre related? Because Andre has like the really big red hair. I'm like, I don't know. I just needed a name. And honest to God, for her name, I had the player's handbook on me. God. <clears throat> and so I just flipped to the human names and found one that sounded neat. But, uh, Oh yeah. Oh, I do that too. I mm-hmm. have a I have a name generator up during That's each campaign just in brilliant. case. That's actually really smart, but I don't know of any. That's like, fair. Uh, the other thing I name generator. The thing Mercer, because uh, so I just sort of like, that Mercer, which I was watched religiously when I got into DMing. Um, he like because he knew the cultures of the characters. He found names from those cultures and wrote them down on sticky notes, with like in bold the words being like gnome names orc names so then they were so maybe for you that might be a good idea spy yeah i mean for for gnome names especially like that's going to be pretty easy because gnomes are sort of like a oh that's inspired fine. by like celtic and um pre certainly pre-roman mm-hmm. um british isles but um they have more like like welsh names basically like Celtic and uh, sorry, Celtic and um, Welsh yeah. and stuff like that, which is some of the most common yeah. surnames today. That's fair. So, um, yeah. hmm? <laughs> moral of the story, Mocha: Do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Christ. Okay. Oh, we kind of answered okay. this next one a little bit in our tangents. So, yay us. Um. Pixie asked, uh, how do you plan good? I can't plan good. I need advice on how to plan good. You don't so plan here's good. the thing. I overplan oh, for my first mm-hmm. gameplay session. Mm-hmm. I have like a five-page document mm-hmm. just about the first oh, session. Oh, uh, oh, oh. Uh, I planned out like five, five separate locations in the city that they had the option to go to. But, like, halfway through writing these, I thought, no, I know exactly where they're going to go. And it, it, coincidentally, that's exactly where they need to go. <laughs> so I'm just going to write out, I'm going to finish writing out the stuff for the places that they need to go, which were, of course, the Tavern and the Arcane Science Institute, because I was playing with a drunkard monk and a um, necromancer who got, almost got his medical license. So I just I knew where they were gonna go, but I just wanted to have options. And then halfway through writing these other options, I'm like, yeah, fuck it, they're not gonna bother with these. So that actually it makes me think of a tweet that I just saved um, last night from Seth or Amy on Twitter. They said, "Me DMing my first few sessions. I have 46 pages of notes and 28 tabs of the DMG and PHB open. I'm nervous. Me preparing for my 14th session. Who knows what's going to happen." Definitely not me. Least of all me. My intention is to eat this quarter page of notes five minutes into the game. <laughs> yep. So oh, yeah. that's, that's such a call out post. I know. I had because, to save it. Because um little backstory on the Frostwalkers. I think I've told you guys this, but for the sake of people listening, if people listen. Um it started off as a setting for a home game. You know the whole bullshit with Caleb and the Shadow Dragon? That was supposed to be the campaign. That was the campaign I was writing. The Shadow Dragon was the big antagonist. And I'll tell you this, because we're, you know, spilling our guts. Um, Christ, this is so embarrassing. You want to know why I picked the Shadow Dragon? Because I started the campaign wanting something like Ultra Necrozma from Ultra Sun and Moon. Fuck yes, that's <laughs> so valid. You're so valid. I saw that giant light dragon and went, that's cool. 
<laughs> and then like that's so valid the idea, I, I the idea of it that. eating light and i was like wow that could be a really devastating thing but you know pokemon's pokemon doesn't really touch on how fucking devastating that would be to a society um <clears throat> i was just like yeah uh you know um <clears throat> That, that sounds cool. So then I brought it to my buddy Jackson. I was like, I want this. And he's just like, oh, you need help. <laughs> and so he, he showed me a shadow dragon. And I was like, that works. And so that be- was going to be the campaign. The party was going to start up in Tim Shull. Tim Shull wasn't actually supposed to be that important. It was just sort of their hub town where nothing would happen and they could feel safe there. Um, and eventually... Right, Until but the first session there, well, basically the whole map out of the first game I DM'd with these people, I still have it. They got into town, uh, these half dragons were, who, these half shadow dragons were attacking, using the half dragon veteran stats, they were like star 5. They were pretty cool though, because um, it was the first time they ever come across something that wasn't in Lost Minds of Fandelver. And so to throw them into something that different and weird that early was fun. Um, and then the boss fight, then the boss fight was just cool. a flat out white <laughs> dragon. Just that was perching. A- no, because it was uh, young, which was six, and they were like six, so it was pretty even actually. I was worried, but they they did it. I actually had to buff the thing's health to make it more of a threat, to be honest. But uh, it was a really fun Fair. fight. But I remember I had pages upon pages of notes for this, including like what each shop had. And I remember kicking myself in the pants because someone was like, I want to go to like a, a place to get a horse. I'm just like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized the stable how the fuck was I supposed to know this dude wanted a horse? <laughs> like, and that was sort of what broke me to it because I'd also remember sending Shay and a few other people, shout out to my buddies on Instagram. Uh, they who refer to their D and D party collectively as the Flourish Gang. Um, <clears throat> the Flour the Flourish Gang. They're wonderful. The what? I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, oh, I, I thought you said the <clears throat> Flourish Gang. I remember I'm like, posting what? all my notes and just like, is this good? And I remember they were all like, Are you, what? What time is it for you? One a.m. Not important. <laughs> right. But I remember when the whole thing with the stables me, happened, I was actually good? really like. Damn, how did I forget that? But then I realized, the fuck was I supposed to know that would happen? I can't blame myself for that. I didn't know this fucker would just wake up today and decide a horse. Horse time. And you know what ended up being the horse shopkeeper? A a centaur named Colt Anderson. Was that slavery? We didn't talk about it. (laughs) Colt Anderson did not have to (laughs) answer Colt Anderson's (laughs) business. Yeah, we, I'm we sorry to worry about horse, but was that slavery? But like, we didn't talk about it. That just fucking murdered me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that was how it, I realized I've the been best shit prone. in DD is when you don't have anything prepared and you kind of got to roll with it. And so the first couple episodes of the podcast, because I was like, it's a podcast. It's different. I have to be more professional, TM. You know, I, I had notes. But then as time wore on, I Really, what I need is where they gotta be by the end of the session, and a few ways they can get there, and I'm good. <laughs> I always say, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and that's kind of the same how it's been with the uh, the twenty SA since they've been on the Dominion. It's like I had planned for them to maybe do two <laughs> episodes with these people. And it's going on seven. Well, that's what happens. It's <laughs> so shippable it's characters. Like, oh, we'll get to. I, I got to this point. Where <laughs> I was just like, I know. It's like, good God, this is your first real encounter, and you're already shipping people. This is what you get oh. for making shippable NPCs. Uh, this is your this is your comeuppance. Romanceable NPCs. But I was just like, I got to this point where I'm like, okay, right. I have the basis of right. when I first made the Dominion. Oh, I need more. What's on there. <laughs> and I get to this point where I'm like, huh. It like Friday night comes. Well, Friday night comes along and I'm just like, oh, we, we campaign Saturday. Found some notes for key points to have them do. 
huh okay so i'll jot down like a quarter page of notes and i'm like i'm just gonna like, you guys get to do what you want today because <laughs> this is apparently another downtime episode go for it oh this happened and that's where we're gonna yeah. end it oh my favorite episode like... of record was maelstrom the the downtime episode because the oh it, it's great <laughs> my i just because that, that was when today <clears throat> I remember what had happened was I needed a note for Sari because Rowan, I knew her brother would send her a message. For Leona, I kind of figured it would be Shira because I wanted to develop that relationship more. And when we had Plank, I just made it someone from his group, from his old clan. I was like, okay, that works. And I had I was just drawing such a blank on Sari. But then I remembered uh, during one of the Road Rage hours, the joke came up that Abex trained Sari and that's why she doesn't know how to do anything because drunken master and a little girl who doesn't know what drunkenness is like would equal cartwheels throwing glitter at people and stuff to that effect <clears throat> because they've seen cartoon drunkenness and i was like that's a funny joke and then that's all that will ever be a funny joke and then when it came time to need something for sorry i was like do i really expend my last expense of dignity yeah <laughs> Hey, hey, Bond. <laughs> I mean, I mean, just look at Barry fucking blue Amazing. jeans. <laughs> uh, my first cosplay from Taz. Um, so... Honestly, yeah. I so I honestly, I the first episode, I kind of actually had. Um, I have the exact right amount. Well, I, I sort of overplanned with the extra places, but in terms of the places that they went to, I had the right amount of notes taken. Um, and so we we stopped. We we called time exactly where my notes for that session and my notes for the whole campaign up to this point ended, or at least well for the details. Um, and so I was incredibly relieved because I thought we were going to last a lot longer and I would have to bullshit the <laughs> Bulette fight. Um, spoilers to my players. Um, oh, well. <laughs> I pulled that in the third. There are in-game yep, consequences favorite, uh, for ignoring the was sun. In episode three, all the way back in Horde of the Inland. I'm sorry if Cass is able to hear us. I'm sorry, Cass, that you ended up in the receiving end of that bullshit. Because as soon as the gang decided, let's let the hag live, I was like, that's a bad idea. <laughs> oh, Cass moved to the uh, bedroom because okay, cool. I think that's, I was being cool. too loud. But either way, to I was edit. like, yeah, this will be so. a fun like homage to early D&D. Dungeon crawl, there'll be some mean locks, they'll kill a hag, it'll just it'll be great. They let the hag live, and I'm just sitting there. Like, well, this ends the entire plan I have for the back like, half of this arc. Shit. <clears throat> oh man, I know. Like, I'm constantly sort of terrified that they are going to that my players are going to do something that I'm not expecting. And I have to rethink That's what I did everything that I have. The Fosters, because the, the first half was supposed to die episode three. And the whole shit that starts, I think, seven onward, at seven to eight, yeah, it only became seven and eight where this was a puppet, was supposed to be like five to eight. It was supposed to be a much bigger thing. <clears throat> but because they had to seek vengeance on the first tag, you know, I just had to, I was like, shit, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? But it was a good exercise. Right. But then I had to put you know, in a good as exercise. Leona put it, they like, had to finish what okay, they started. Okay, what would these hags plan if one of them made it out alive? You know what I mean? It became a good exercise of what the villains had to do. Yeah. yeah. I actually... I had to do something like that uh, for the since the third episode. When oh. Nora oh, yeah. herself to Gabriel. Oh, like you weren't expecting that, were you? I was not expecting that, um, because this is a this, this oh is a guy no, that was, like, in and then she, of she fucking her, made a call out post on Twitter. She just revealed <laughs> that she's <laughs> pretty much. She like she revealed she dropped many faces to reveal. Oh that she no! Shit. 
fuck with this pirate <laughs> and this other guy. So she kind of like fucked over her teammates. Now they're on not a manhunt for the Miss Lily because, because they know. Now Gabriel, yeah, Gabriel knows what that ship is and who is the captain of that ship. So he's going to be looking for botches. So that was the whole thing. I'm like, oh, that kind of, like, that's something. And then I told Kaz today, we were talking about the podcast, and Nora has this really bad habit of splitting the party. She's very sassy, and she just wants to go out on her own and do her own thing. I told Kaz today, I'm like, look, you know, I'm totally fine with that. But the more she does it, they're gonna oh yeah, because the the Sanctum's a shady ass organization. Like, she's gonna they will oh, yeah. absolutely put a bounty on these fuckers' heads. Oh yeah, Big Brother is watching. Bright Sanctum will always watch. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> that's creepy as shit. Um, so I think that's <laughs> a good segue into I believe the last one people put on this server. Uh, <clears throat> I'll I'll do a quick spot check after this. So. To just so that I don't miss anyone's, but uh, I think the last real question, and then we can just get into like if we have anything for each other and just shooting the shit for a hot minute or so. Um, <clears throat> Lee asks, How do you deal with a frequently mutating cast in story and in real life? Um, so some context to Lee's question uh, Lee runs a home game <clears throat> with some like high school, college friends, well, not, I think just high school friends. Um, because it's a home game and just the situation she's in, it's not a consistent group. And because it's not a consistent group, people hop in, hop out, you know, uh, on the reg. Uh, I was actually really flattered mm-hmm. because Lee came up to me and was like, hey, could I run this game in Tim Shoal? And I was just like, absolutely. And she was like, cool, could I like get like a basic amount of things, not too much spoilers, but like Aww. list of character, you know, just a list of NPCs. I was like, oh, absolutely. <clears throat> and I was like, feel free to use like the cast as NPCs, but my rule was like, just like don't kill them, and don't like do anything that would break the world, <laughs> you know. I was because like that's my yeah. I was just like, just don't kill characters that aren't mine. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, oh yeah, for sure, but. <clears throat> So thank you, Lee. That was super flattering. It made me feel like I was doing a good job. Um, but yeah, I guess with a group that comes in and out, uh, how do you form a story around that? Um, if I if I may, uh, our uh, cast is actually kind of mutating. Um, we have four players, but for the first few episodes, um, uh, I mean, they're in the first, uh, they're in the setup episode, but um, for the first few episodes, uh, it's actually just going to be the two players. Um, it's just going to mm-hmm. be Lexi and Jason playing uh, Saturn and um, Katita because of uh, extenuating cir- circumstances. Um, because Will uh, is sort uh. of financially volatile situation uh and getting situated in job um and uh delta is um has uh long story short her mm-hmm. data plan is very limited uh, audio recording her wi-fi bad, is really crappy bad gig. Um, gotcha so she yeah well it's not it's not the recording it's actually the actual recording is fine but what happens is she only has enough data, ah. barely, to do one session a month. Oh, wow. And um, if that, so we're just sort of waiting it out um, until yeah. the, both of those mm-hmm. those I mean, them can find no, no, sort of better you circumstances. Yeah, go, go. Keep going. Um, I'm sorry. But... I mean, especially the past few weeks has been just absolute chaos in everybody's yeah. life, especially me. Uh, I'm sure you guys know why. Um, but mm. at, uh, now that things have sort of calmed down, I have much more time on the right. to just do sort of whatever. Um, and that includes like, yeah. like 
that includes of course the escape artist which i'm <sighs> sort of putting off editing um but also uh, my other podcasts uh, oh god i love star hopper radio star hopper um deal the the cast morphed in a really interesting way because like i said i start I, before we got on call we talked a little bit um <clears throat> it started off with people i knew you know like misty was a friend for about two years i was a friend for about two years graham was my friend all throughout high school you know uh the only exceptions to the being people i knew were uh rowan and talia talia was someone who because i i wanted someone who knew the game more than i did <laughs> so i made <sighs> it Lowest of my low points, I joke. Uh, I made a post on Reddit <clears throat> asking about if people wanted to, were interested. And they were like the one person who was in our age range. I love all of the people who were super excited and interested and had characters and were a bit older, but it was like when the crew's collective median age was 17 or like 18, having someone who's like 30 on the show seemed a little, <laughs> you know. Yeah, like not to say I wouldn't play with them in any other circumstance. I'm sure they're great people, you know. Yeah, that that's the thing, right? But it's just sort of consistency of, uh, and it's Absolutely. it's all about um and because most of the people I knew, that, I knew bring, came from, and people um, making sure that your other cast members kind of. were comfortable as well. <clears throat> but Megan was in that age range, and Che I met through an Instagram live stream they were yeah. just doing art and it was a really funny premise it was like i have a someone suggest a dumbass name i'll try and make a character around it and i didn't suggest it someone suggested throgborn i turned it into half orc cook boy who used his and great accent as, as a cutting knife <laughs> and the rest is history and what ended up happening just the weirdness of it all Graham oh and Rev God. are two of the people yes. who come on on occasion. Perfect. I was so happy Andre got to be on the on the Arc One finale. Um, but Plank, yeah, uh, Plank didn't. Plank's only showed up a few times. Andre's only showed up a few times. Misty and Shira because they got a really good uh, art school in. Oh yay! Spent like all of last semester working on their portfolio, and all of this semester freaking out about you know starting school. Um, <clears throat> so her time as Shira kind of came to an abrupt halt, but Shira's remained an NPC that Misty has a lot of control over through messages and stuff. Yeah. Um, but inherently, uh, Artie, who plays Leona, and Sari uh, with Livy, kind of just were people who started off being like, oh, I'm interested in the show as like a fan. And then eventually, when the time came that we needed people to make a party, <clears throat> they were like, hey, I have this character. I was like, yeah, that's awesome. I just went through Instagram today, just on a whim, you know? Sometimes you just read through old messages for shits. I, I was looking through the ones on the Frostwalker server, and the first thing Livy had ever contacted us with was when we were doing that yeah, NPC I know. thing. Where, like, that feeling. You can submit an NPC to the town, you know? And sure enough, the NPC they enlisted was sorry. It's like, looking back on it, that's hilarious because Sari ends up becoming mm -hmm. one of the main characters. Oops, everyone's favorite character. I love Sari. <laughs> um, but like, Tim Schull's great for that because it's set in a town that people live in. <laughs> so. Sari is so good. I love it. Yeah. It's yeah, just the that's people what who I live love in the most town. about Tim Shull. Is that's my big that scare with really the Ravnica interlude because um, the inherently the people the in that storyline are the people house. who ended up being warped there, which are Leona, Sari, Rowan, Andre, Plank, who I threw in as an NPC just in case Graham wanted to show up, and uh, Mason, you know, uh, another NPC, and Caleb. But inherently, if Rev, if two of my players can't make it, like, I, mm -hmm. I'm kind of screwed <laughs> for that whole week of recording. Um, that's my fear with the Ravnican interlude. But uh, at the same time, I'm very confident that at this point, that like at least yeah. Rowan, Leona, and Sari have always sort of turned into my A cast who are always kind of there. So I'm, I'm kind of confident, but you know. That's the thing about a mutating cast. You can explain it away, especially in a home game where you're not recording. Uh, that's one of those things where a podcast kind of hurts the 
being able yeah. to explain just shit away. Oh, yeah. Continuity is much more important in podcasting than it is in home games, because, like, when I couldn't make it to... I, I was almost universally late to uh, the game where Jatai was originally uh, my character. Um, and their consistent excuse was, if I, if I just couldn't make it to a game at all, they left me back in a tavern with some catnip. Um, <laughs> or uh, if I was late, they basically either I showed up late in character yeah, it's and we're just like, all right. Well, no, it, all right, what the fuck have you guys done now? Home games. There's um, a lot less or stress, I've just, and like, I think this leads into something. I think the three of us will agree on. Uh, <laughs> you know, doing <clears throat> typical cat stuff. In the age of D and D podcasting, as much as it's great, and I love it, and I have to owe a lot to it. I think casual D and D has a weird thing where they want to be like, where people say like, "Why is not my home game like Taz or Critical Role?" And that's because inherently, it's a different. Right. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, it's a different. It's a different sort of format. It's a different. For sure. And like the best it's things... Different people too. Yeah, you don't. You never want to compare your podcast to another podcast. Like everybody's podcast is completely different, and try like getting upset that's a uh, you know i actually had a little bit of a that about two weeks ago i was just like oh i don't know if our podcast is really that great and like I, it's, it's yeah exactly and that's my thing and my crew like, came and like slapped me I, and they're just like shut what up. i found so interesting about Start this community more. versus others we're playing this saturday I'm like, is about having fun. with different podcasts there is that feeling of everyone's is different everyone can do their own thing and it's nice but like as a creator, as someone who likes writing and likes doing their own thing, to me, what's exciting is that there's such an ease of collaborative access. Like, with other communities, if you wanted to do a collaboration project, it, it, it's a lot harder because there's different mediums involved and stuff like that, you know? With this, it's like, you're playing the same game. You know the basic rules. So long as you could craft a story where a collaboration of sorts makes sense, you can yeah. do it easily. And it's fun. You know what I mean? Like, why? that's my thing. Why compete when you can collaborate is, my, is where I'm always, is my sort of mantra. And it's like, well, that, and oh, also yeah, like, yeah. for example, having Abex be a character in the show because I needed one. And then... The whole thing with the tarot card and invo that was just crossovers are the shit I'm, i know what my, i'm sorry if it came off as like me being like can i please can i please or kind of annoyingly but like for me that was the coolest shit because it was like this is someone else's baby and they have entrusted me with doing well with it, and i want to do right <clears throat> it's like but uh, on the other hand as a creator it's like there's a lot of awesome feeling when you get to show someone else's thing off and be like, hey, this is really fucking oh, cool. <laughs> oh, bless you. Oh, absolutely. I know that feeling so much. Um, and real quick. Look. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> bless you. I just sneezed so hard I knocked my headphones off. I heard that. That was That was intense. <laughs> It's okay, I sneeze like a little kitten, so <laughs> it it evens out. Um oh, yeah. on the subject of both um doing things right and showing off other people's stuff. I think I was there for this. Um, was this presentation? This is the first time you told me about the like that story, I think. Super important to me. And I was talking to Shay about it uh like a week ago or so. Um <clears throat> Yeah, because like I have so much respect for indigenous cultures and uh, of any sort, and I really yeah, like um, I'm kind of sick and tired of European fantasy. I mean, it's I enjoy it, but it gets old after a while, and there's a huge world that we live in that needs to be 
explored um, in fiction. And so representation is super important to me. And when I was making Adrian, I took a big hard look at the Well, I, I didn't even really do that at first. I just thought, hmm, what are some cultures that I think are and I don't see a lot of in fantasy fiction? Let's see. Well, of course, there's like Polynesian and Maori culture. There's, oh, I love Inuit culture and Native American culture as a whole. Um, both both Americas, South and North. Um, and uh, let's throw in some uh, pre pre colonial African culture, uh, halflings, and maybe mix that with like Central Asian, and it just sort of spiraled from there. And I ended up with like the lizard folk are inspired by um, Meso ancient Mesoamerican culture and. It's just, it's evolved into something that's way more diverse than any other fantasy world that I've seen so far. Yes. Um, um, and sort of, real quick plug here in case this gets published, uh, support Swords Fall on Kickstarter. It looks so um, cool. Swords Fall is so fucking cool. I love it, and I really want to do a game there once it's released. Um, it's so <laughs> fucking cool. And the, the team... And the creators are amazing people. Um, but yeah, so one of the main driving forces of Adrian is representing right. a much wider scope of like, hey, if you think this is cool in fantasy, right. you should check out the real thing. Because these people exist in real life to a degree. Um, so, and that extends also to like, yeah. um, sort of do a more subtle extent to like lgbt representation um it's like one of our main characters is very outspokenly lesbian and um beyond that like normalize it right it's just mm -hmm. i plan on having npcs that are just you know casually mention yeah. their spouse it being is. like the same gender or just throwing out a they pronoun here and there it's yeah it's not hard hard it's, it's not. really actually, not actually we just uh uh like a single father in the last episode there's uh like we're representing <gasps> i have a a little deaf boy at my school that he found out that i was doing a D, D podcast and he was i learned some oh. sign language to talk with him and he told me that his dad plays D. &D. And so I made a NPC based off of him that's going to be showing up in a little bit. Uh, I have a, you know, blind, there's the LGBTQ uh, representation and it's all these yeah, little things and... that are kind of like popping up and it's really cool to like. Yeah. See. Especially like um, disability rep is something that I kind of have to work on. Cause it's I kind of, it, of, it's like in a um, weird way. Didn't like when you're playing a game it? of D and D, um, but like, w like at base, you know, you have your characters and you have your your monsters. And besides, like townsfolk NPCs, where you're really where you can shine with those representational moments, like I feel like especially stuff like disability representation is one of those things that, like, when you're playing typical dungeon crawling, you really don't think about it, you know, unless one of your characters has it. But then, like. I hate to mm -hmm. say it because, like, I bet you, especially in like early editions of D and D, like stuff like that would absolutely constitute like almost bad, like bad consequences when in all reality, not that in real life, you know. But how do you show it in the game, you know? Which is like, again, mm -hmm. that's why townsfolk NPC nice way to do that because yeah. when you're doing monsters and your characters alone in a woods somewhere. That's not something that really comes up. So, unless one of your characters is exactly, unless one of your characters is, yeah, yeah. And we we actually talked about this. I talked about this with um, Saturn's player. Um, both both me and Saturn's player Jason are on the autism spectrum, and we agree that like yeah, Saturn just the way he is, we think he's also on the spectrum, and it makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, and he's a half elf, and while ordinarily half elves get a bonus to their charisma, we agreed that like 
yeah, he's really not a charismatic person. <laughs> Both by virtue of there are autism, some, pretty, uh, some forms of the spectrum comes out that. mean, but it's just like, yeah, both both me and I, both me and Jason, are right? Like, yeah, no, that We're, sounds neither weird. of us are particularly charismatic, but um, <laughs> but also just, just like the way that Saturn, the way that Saturn is as a person, like he is not the most charismatic person. So we agree that like, yeah, plus. His bonus should go to intelligence because that's like his thing. He is a genius, but he is an underappreciated genius because his his views and his morality differ from everybody else around him, and that's not a bad thing. Like he genuinely wants to help people, but the way, the way that he's going about it is something is he does or he views that's always things interesting in to play that with. People don't agree with. Uh, so. I guess short answer to the whole mm -hmm. uh, rotating cast thing is try because you're. I know we went on a tangent, but it, that's great. Oh no, I'm glad <laughs> we did, and I want to come back to it. But just to deep. bookmark it for Lee, and then we can jump back to just us talking because um, that was really the point. My point was some questions, but most of it is us just talking and getting to enjoy each other's company for a bit. Um, <clears throat> book and Lee's question: uh, If you can work it into the story, great. Otherwise, it's a home game. <laughs> Like, that sounds so condescending, but that's the beauty of, like, D&D. &D. Don't think about it. Don't, Don't sweat. worry about it. <laughs> if a character is not there, uh, come up with a funny reason that makes the rest of the people at the table laugh. If, if it... <laughs> exactly. Like, like if, they're it, at if home, it gets a chuckle out of everyone else, in their room. <laughs> and there's no hard feelings about the reason why they couldn't make it, then you'll be surprised how wonderful it is, you know? And another thing you can do is if, like, if you have, if you have a party and they're, like, in the middle of doing something, like, you guys are in the middle of traveling, uh, what we do for the patron campaign with Lawful Stupid is we only do four players uh, at a turn, but there's eight of us that play. So what it is is we, we rotate out, and it's just, we, it's assumed that the other characters are there, but they're not involved in any fights or anything like that. Yeah. It works out really well, like... Uh, that, yeah, that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it just depends. Now I guess I have no questions uh, from other people, which is... Yeah, but what that, that means it gets into my favorite part, where I get to... Mm -hmm. I have a few probing questions I wanted to throw into the room for fun. Uh, uh, first one, we danced about the oh, romance of old PC thing, and I kind of want to talk about it, because I think... In a podcast, especially with Critical Role in the Adventure Zone, a lot of the draw came from some of the ships. You know, in in Critical Role, you have some like some examples off the top of my head, where like Percy and Vex. You know, and from the Adventure Zone, of course, there was Taco and Kravitz. Yeah. Uh, the thing with Barry and Loop was awesome. Barry um, and Loop, but like, I guess going off of that, as people who work both just in D&D &D in general and in the case of podcasting. Uh, and I think Lance and I and Spyglass can have a really funny story in a hot minute. But, um, because I think we all know the joke I'm about to pull. <laughs> but uh, for the sake of probing questions, um, how do you guys approach that? Like, Because, yeah, I mean, I know for a lot of the cases, Romance for me, PC. it's a lot of like, I got lucky because some of my characters were like, like with Leona, um, when she was made, I guess, a, I don't know how much of this already is cool with me telling. Yeah, I can cut it if she doesn't like it. Um, Leona was made for a Monster of the Week campaign. And so that was easy. For me. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And I got to introduce Mason last episode, which was cool, and start off that train. But then what happened, <laughs> love you, V, but. But then what happened was Lilith came on the scene. <laughs> and instantly was floored. Like, it was so oh, funny. Boy. I loved that whole dynamic. But it became a funny thing where it was like, what happens here? And what I love about Tim Scholl is that so many of these characters came from other people's brains and, like, I get to use them. But there's also part of me with, like, characters specifically like Lilith, who's more of a 
guest star than the PC, than an NPC, the way Mason is. It's like, it's harder to work those out as romances because much briefer time, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll yeah, shut up. But absolutely, basically, yeah. I got lucky with my romantic NPCs because a lot of people had who they were kind of interested in going in. And I just was like, okay, I can plug at that, you know? But for people who start with nothing, where, where do you guys come from with that? Uh, um, I'll let Lance go first because I have really no commentary on this. So, like, okay. With Botches, we, like, we kind of played around with his backstory. I gave him some, like, bonds that he already had with people on his home planet and that kind of stuff. And uh, he he came to me and he asked me, he's like, hey, can Botches have had a recent, like, you know, a, a thing with this NPC at one point? And I was like, yeah totally it's over now but you know uh but recently there was a little bit of a shipping thing on dominion Mm -hmm. which i was not prepared for uh but it worked out really well uh it was between daythorn and uh oh yeah this guy named martel and we were not it's like i was not expecting it to really go anywhere it turned into more of an awkward uh kind of like awkward first date thing like i let them go like to dinner and they were both so awkward it didn't really transform into anything but they exchanged emails and uh which they actually wait hold on i i'm so sorry but i have to ask since since google is Dougal in this um, is it D-mail? Oh, no! <laughs> no, that's dirty. That's dirty, Spy. Actually, it's, a. Uh... It didn't... It wasn't meant to be. It was a genuine question instead oh. of Gmail. Oh. No, it's, it's I space... It. I get it. Now. It's space mail. Um, actually... Okay, you... that's valid. <laughs> Sensible NPC thing. I... I totally am down with it. Um, there's actually been quite a few shipping already, and it's just like, oh, you're just gonna like. I'm sorry. You guys are just gonna <laughs> ship with everyone, aren't you? Okay. Um, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Actually, it's not just with you. Like, it's some other shipping. Wonderful. Going on, and I'm I glad. Was not expecting it. I'm glad. I'm not the only. It's glad uh, I'm not the only fucker. Like, I mean, everybody really loves Cito. Like everybody's shipping Cito oh, with everyone. Course. And I'm just like, he is a pure bean. Come oh, on, of course. Guys. I don't ship Cito with anyone because he's. I mean, I envision him as literally. A child. Well, how old is he? He's, he's like he's, a year he's old. A year yeah, old, yeah, I've always viewed Cito's relationship. I view Cito's relationship with everyone being like the little brother. But, um, absolutely, same here. Like he's just he's just a small dude who needs to be taught the ways of the world. Not, not protected, but Bro, just like they, like start to you know show He around. needs to well, learn know, about it's the world. Like any. Uh, any relationship, you're gonna have to work for it. Things are gonna be really awkward at first. You can't just jump in and be like, "This is my boo now," and you know, if it's an M- with an NPC, True. like that's where I come in and I'm like, yeah. "Okay, well, you guys are gonna have to work for it, or they're gonna be <clears throat> awkward, or anything like that." It's between two PCs. It's like, well, then they around. get to work with. They would get to work it out with each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I guess. I've been saying I'm sorry enough that we could maybe go into this for the sake of comedy, um, because really that's all it is for me at this point. Is just it's funny, and if it happens, it happens, and if not, whatever the fuck, you know. Uh, yeah, but that's the that's my thing with romantic NPCs is you got to keep a, a, the head of if it happens, it happens. If not, whatever the fuck. Like it's just absolutely. If you keep a, if you keep a fun like this is fun. This is just a game and nothing about this really matters outside of the game, you know? Like, if you keep that in mind, then I think it's fun and if both people are on board, if it's two PCs, then it's Mm -hmm. fine, you know? Mm -hmm. Or if the player player and the DM are on board and they know the boundary. Knowing the boundary is actually very important. Boundaries are... Yeah, I... Yeah, I was about to say, like, 
it's really important to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. Like with two people, especially, especially, especially like in like context of the game. Oh yeah, and like in not even out just of game boundaries as well. Yeah, especially like I mean, as the DM, I've set some boundaries with my players. Like there are right. certain things that we're just not going to do. Like yeah. I've sort of adopted the same unspoken no bummer yeah. policy as the McElroys because like yeah. this is supposed to be a fun show that people listen to and enjoy. Right. You're not I coming mean, here to you're not you're not putting in your headphones excited to hear like transphobic jokes. Yeah. That's not exactly. our thing. Right, exactly. My thing is like you also need to know the difference between in game okay and out of game okay. Because mm -hmm. if you if it's between two PCs, for example, uh, out of game, they can talk about whatever they want, and it's fine. But they have to know that that doesn't transfer to the game. Yeah, yeah. Like, but if but if everyone's aware of the boundaries, if everyone's just having a good time, then it's one of the most easy ways to throw in a lot of fun hooks for characters. Mm -hmm. But I guess going back to why I've been saying I'm sorry for people who don't know. For like the two people who don't know, <laughs> who who are fr friends with us, who don't know, uh, how did this even start? Oh, I remember exactly how it started because I laugh about it all the time. I made a stupid comment <laughs> on Instagram one time, and then Avon drew a thing, and the rest is history. <laughs> yep, you're talking about absolutely Balaam. Balaam. Mm -hmm. Yep, everyone, my only OTP. <laughs> I mean, what's so funny to me about this is, like, as the DM of my show, and as a DM of a podcast, I know the inherent lunacy of this. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is two characters, yeah. one of them in NPC status, another in PC status, from two completely separate shows. Like, inherently, yeah. it makes no sense. And, like... We've joked about doing things with it just for the sake of, like, whatever, you know? As far as I'm concerned, Balaam is coming. There's nothing <laughs> you can do to change my mind. No. I mean, if it never gets addressed, you can believe what you want, is the great thing about D&D. <laughs> Unless confirmed otherwise. Fill in the blanks is yeah, the best part. Fill in the blank. D &D. If it doesn't, it, it, if, it, if nothing else is said, you can believe what you like. But, like, I don't know if it, I guess for the sake of argument, if I ever or if you guys ever showed up in the Frostwalkers or vice versa, you know, we could play with it for like while we have that time, it could be fun to play with, you know. But yeah. mm -hmm. but inherently, because of the inherent lunacy of the situation, it would be really difficult to make something that made sense, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but then again, you know, if two people are on board with it, and everyone again, if you know the boundaries, if you're having a good time, go for it. Especially if you're in a home game, you know. Yeah. Like with us, we yeah. have to worry about so, scheduling and the canons of our respective shows. If you're in a home game, no one gives a shit about that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, um, and I'm just gonna throw my personal two cents in here um i don't really have any experience i barely have experience in making npcs in right zone, but um i have no experience in making romanceable npcs but you do i'll just say this little statement any npc can be a NPC if you party with a bar <laughs> god you're right though <laughs> the the rule of thumb is for me when it comes to like if someone instantly becomes attracted to one of the characters i just throw out there because it's happened um <clears throat> Rule of thumb, know who this character is at a baseline. For example, this is a shopkeeper. Does shopkeeper have husband or wife? Yes. Okay. Will they be hostile about someone flirting with them who isn't husband or wife? Yes or no? Uh, yes. Okay. You have your situation. <laughs> Go. <laughs> that's, that's sort of my two Q&As when it comes to <laughs> random characters people flirt with. Are they in a committed relationship? Yay, nay. Uh, let's say yeah. Are they upset or would they be upset if someone else hit on them Man, nah. you know what i mean those like, are the two those are the two boxes you really have to make sure you take exactly off before diving at first right other then with that you kind of know the baseline of how they respond mm -hmm. and then you can play off of 
that's that like those are then those boxes you could tick off mentally in a nanosecond you know what i mean just like yeah there was someone but they're cool with it like there was someone in the relationship or close relationship yeah exactly and once you click those boxes it's like have a time go you know (laughs) you guys want to hear a spoiler go for it okay it's got to be cut out make a note i okay correct my last probing question and then if you guys want to throw anything pot please um i don't i don't know how long you guys have so no, we I can cut whenever i got all okay. night <laughs> cool so we can lance when you're just let us know when you're done we'll sign off officially and then me and spy can keep talking i guess um okay. uh last probing question then um okay yeah all right we kind of danced around this so i think it's a nice thing to go uh as people who work in podcasting what is your stance on Stuff to the effect of like working with other shows on stuff, you know. Like we talked about the whole like I said my whole thing about collaboration over confrontation, you know. Like, yeah. Why fight so, for a place in a in a in this group when you can work with someone on it? Um, and Tim Schull as a whole setting is very open to. Hey, is that a cool character you want to see on the show? Yeet their name over to me, and I'll make it happen. You know. <laughs> But that's just yeah. that's the way I was able, just the setting in general allevi- allowed me to have such a nice way to connect that, you know? Yeah. Because, like, when yeah. I started with the Frostwalkers, uh, me and Shay had a conversation about, like, what's our equivalent of a fantasy Costco? Yes. <laughs> because, like, people were able to submit weapons and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. And then I was like, we'll do one better. We'll let people throw in townsfolk. And then perfect, should, honestly. Yeah. Perfect for the setting. Exactly. But like with that in mind, then also like we've I've talked with both of you in the past about being like about like doing stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know how much of that's gonna come to fruition because scheduling and other shit and where we are in stories See, and all that. The trouble with homebrew is especially in like my case of Adrian, where there's no like own interdimensional travel or whatnot is it's really hard to find an excuse for other people's characters to exactly that's that was what i was going to ask because like your settings are different than tim Schull, so how does your setting allow slash disallow for that yeah, sort of especially thing? since and, like the and very, as a personal creator what's your stance you know the very physics of adrian like the magical physics the arcane nature of the adrian universe is very different from um, your base, baseline vanilla D and D, which Tim Soul is using. I mean, base, Tim Soul is canonically like in favor, right? Yeah, yeah. Because most of my players were new. Was like the reason I made that choice was because most of my players were new, setting, and I didn't want to introduce them to the world of Five E, and then say, "Fuck that! Here's this." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was like, um, first time out, let's let's stick with what you know, you know. Yeah, so, I mean, I do want to work something out, but the beauty of the escape artist as a separate entity from the campaign of Death and All His Friends is that, that we can do, like, one-shots with new characters and, um, yeah, yeah. in different settings. Like, um, April so Fool's Swords Fall year. one? Yes, it's like Swords Fall or April Fool's next year, I want to do a one-shot set in my absurdist fantasy world of Crundle. Um, which I am super looking forward to. Oh god, it is my wonderful. favorite of my world. It's so fucking stupid. I love it to death. <laughs> it's like that one person that you're just like, why am I friends with you? <laughs> but you're wonderful. <laughs> uh, but no, okay, yeah. Uh, Lance, for 20SA, for the sake of argument, like, how do you feel about that? With the setting you've created and so... also like uh, your stance as a creator. So I am like, I, one of the main reasons, like, okay, besides me being just a, a whore for space. Um, <laughs> God, I that's mean, a aren't, mood. Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> um, and mainly because I really wanted to, like, challenge myself and not just have it in a, in a single world setting. Right. And that way I could just also, thanks for let the my imagination toast, explode guys. with, you know, <laughs> oh, I want to do an ice thing. Okay, let's go to an ice planet. Yeah, for sure. Also, thanks for the call hey, well, out. Posts. Hey, there's this planet <laughs> over here that let's go to it. Uh, 
Right. I mean, it lets you do whatever but the hell you is, want. There it's great. are definitely opportunities where we could do a one shot. Yeah. On Tim Schull or, you know, crashes into the world of lawful stupid or, you know, something like something like that. Yeah. It's, it's not. Um, it's space magic. Like not all the planets are going to be advanced and like futuristic. Or they might be so more they are than have that like, kind of old timey fantasy ness to it. Yeah, which and, is really cool. The, so yeah, the definitely fusion like, of I I don't really think I've ever future, seen the definitely fusion want to have of one classical. Yeah. With... I, yeah. Yeah. You guys still there? This planet draws this other podcast's world into chaos. You know. Yeah, it's fun. My the... Wi-Fi cut out for a minute. Oh, it's okay. But yeah, no, I totally agree. I just think, again, of course, it always comes down to when we can and when the story allows stuff like that to happen, you yeah. know? Like, that's my thing. Because, you know, in a blind dream world, you want to meet another crew of D&D players and you're instant, like, in the beauty of the universe, if everything was out great, you'd be like, hey, come play with us. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's that's your dream with any new person who you meet when you play D&D. Because you want to share stories. That's that's the beauty of the game, is, like, it's all about just telling a good story with friends, you know? That's the Yeah, that's pretty much the point behind, right. I think, behind all of our podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, of course... the main point. Yeah. So, of course, dream world, you want to be like, hey, yeah, we can make that work. Let's do it, you know? But... The realities of the situation sometimes mean that, like, you gotta wait a while, or it may not happen, you know? Yeah. Like, cause it's not workable. In, Whatever. You know, <laughs> I have so much planned for this first season. Like, I, my hope is to maybe have two or three seasons of Space Days. Right. Like, I think you've said, I think you've expressed that and other yeah. stuff, so that's not much of a spoiler. I'm just no. sorry. That wasn't to say anything bad. I was just. Oh no! I was no. like, do I make a note? <laughs> no, no. I, I, my, my main goal is to have two or three seasons of this thing because there's gonna be so many loops and twists and like I have them all planned in my head and knowing my crew, they're gonna mess something up. So I'm gonna have even more loops and twists. So right, right. It's you know, it's and there's so there's gonna be plenty of time for those, you know. Those yeah. one shots, those those chances that we can get together and collaborate with other other groups, and like my crew's already asking me for a beach episode. I'm like, guys, it's only episode fourteen. Come on, beach <laughs> planet. Hey, hey, man, it took me ten episodes to cave to Ravnica. So <laughs> well, I don't know if you guys have seen the uh, one of the posts on our. It was one of our earlier ones, actually, the uh, Life Furious postcard. That we put it up. Oh God! It rings. Was, where, where did you put it? It's on where? Instagram. It's on Instagram, and actually, Kaz made it. Oh and my God! Uh, Wait, says, I think I've seen it. But I just don't... or something like that. I feel like I remember this, but I just don't remember from. I'm gonna look right now. It's the beauty of cellular devices. Uh, <laughs> Truly. <laughs> yeah, I see it. Oh my God! Yeah, I've seen it this whole time. Every time I go on your thing, I see it, and yet I always forget it exists. <laughs> Yeah, so that is actually um, a go it's going to be a really fun planet because that's kind of a spa planet. Yes. Perfect. So it's it's right outside of the Thibis and the Kalto system. It's where, you know, the rich and famous kind of go to vacation and get away from their planet for a little while. And I'm, I'm really excited for that one because that is kind of the beach planet. Perfect. Ah, uh, amazing. So. That's gonna be fun. Also, for sure, go down there. Ooh, yay! <laughs> Eat the rich. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Writing notes. <laughs> oh god. Um, but yeah, uh, I think on the whole, and I know that question was both because we brought it up, and I thought it'd be fun to pull on more, and also because I'm absolutely guilty, <laughs> and I'm sorry to the both of you. Because even this was me going like, you know what would be fun? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And then, and like, you were right. It was fun, yeah. But the thing is, like, I always worry when those sorts of things happen. And I tell me if you've heard this. If you come up with an idea, you're like, wow, this is really cool. And you realize it needs someone else's help to get done or another group of people who are your friends. And you're just like, oh, no, I'm going to annoy the shit out of this, aren't I? Yeah, yeah that was my fear with Starhopper. Like, hey, I need a lot of voices for this one. <laughs> Like, inherently, half the time, your friends are like, no, man, I actually had a good time with this, and I want to do it. It's just that scheduling and stuff can't let us right now. But what yeah. it turns into in your, in your brain is, oh, God, they hate me. <laughs> yeah, when but, they say, this is really fun, but I anxiety. just don't have the time right now, it's, uh, yeah, no, this was fucking stupid, and I never want to do it again, so or, don't or, bother me with it. Exactly. Or, <laughs> yeah. or, when, or when they say, I want to do this, give me time, it means how do I skirt you? And like, <laughs> like how <laughs> do I make it? Anxiety is yeah. fun. Isn't it? Saying. We should definitely clear this up for listeners. Like, this is not, this is not what it comes off as socially, that's just what our shit brains interpret it oh, as. Oh, yes. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. that, no, that was yeah. very much the yeah. point. We love all of you, and we know you all don't mean it, and I know you two don't mean it. Like, I know Lance and I have had conversations about my boy someday appearing no, you're incredibly never bothered. valid like that's that's for sure you're never a bother or anything like that yeah. and i'm excited i'm like looking forward to it I actually like i'm <laughs> my players have been a uh, getting on me i promised them one-on-ones i remember you mentioning that yeah and um i think in one day dragon mentioned it to me about five times <laughs> oh no! I was finally just like, okay, give me to the end of the day and I'll have dates for you guys. And she's like, well, there's no worry. Like, there's no rush. And I'm just like, you asked me five times when we're going to do these today. That's a ru- that is a to rush, me, my friend. To be, to be honest, I haven't even started writing those yet. But okay, let's put you next Tuesday, you next Thursday. And, um. Oh no. <laughs> so I'm just sitting here. I'm like, I am so glad I'm on spring break so I can actually write this stuff. Oh yeah. And this part I can also cut. I think the nice thing about having this little secret DM cabal now <laughs> is that uh <laughs> is that if time comes where one of us is like, shit, shit, I'm f- I need help, the other could be like, dude, you have two of us here. <laughs> yeah. Real shit, I'm definitely gonna be relying on the <laughs> you. No, please do. I'm I'm yeah. happy to help. Uh, plus like it'll be I think this is nice. I think this is nice. It is. Uh, that's all I got. If y'all got questions to throw in the community pot, uh, go. But uh, I'm spent. <laughs> um, I kind of wanted to ask, like, just generally, um, how do you guys do um, creatures? Like ooh, what, ooh. How do you decide like what creatures to use in a particular session arc ever? Vola guide to monsters. Do, 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 do. I mean that's a given. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Go ahead, B. I was just gonna say because Tim Schultz a five E fantasy, so I have the beauty of like the monster manual being something I can pull from. Uh but Volos has like a handy thing where it's like, hey, is your main antagonist a coven of hags, mayhaps? And I went, yes, my main antagonist is indeed a coven of a wise book. And it was like, here's a list of minions they'd have. And I'm like, thank you, wise book. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just went with that. Meanlock were not on there. I just remember watching a top 10 countdown of like the scariest monsters in D&D and Meanlock's being number one. And I was just like, I want them now. <laughs> <laughs> For ours, it's a little bit like it. The creatures are a little bit more thought out, like in the ways of I have to think about the atmosphere and like what the surrounding area is, um, mm-hmm. and kind of go off of that of what kind of creatures would live there. Like actually, in the next episode, and you you'll hear it in the um, talking on the Dominion, but the crew is going to have to go after this creature that I homebrewed that Ooh, is called Icoon. 
Are they the espion looking things? They are. They um <laughs> I like how that was the <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it's good. Like I so this creature, I I actually have several homebrew creatures that I would just sit there and I would sit outside. I'd look at my farm animals and I draw random creatures based off of them. So that's oh, that's so cool. so cool. So that's what this was, is I was looking at um our rabbits and our cat. And I was sketching. And so this thing is like a mixture. It looks like between like a rabbit, a cat, and a kangaroo. Yes. So cute. It's That's a so cool. giant like biked scorpion tail. So it's like this is a, a homebrew thing that they're going to have to go after. And so this was like, okay, well, this thing exists on really dusty planets. Like it's hot. They, you know, they live in this kind of setting. and. So every now and then I will create these homebrew things where I'm like, okay, well, I don't want just like a dire wolf or I don't want just a, you know, this goblin. thing, you know, I don't want a goblin. I don't want just goblins. Some... I don't like them. I don't like oh, goblins. Goblin. <laughs> so it's just one of those things I'll look and I'll be like, okay, well, you know this creature lives in this kind of habitat oh but so does this creature hey let's mix them like, <laughs> i love that's it. the best part of creature design honestly is looking at real world environments and seeing what lives there and thinking like uh, for me like i like to think along the lines of evolution like okay mm -hmm. what do we know about this environment in real life like, what lives there what adaptations do these things have how can i mix and match these adaptations to make a cool creature that fits into the phylogeny of the world. Phylogeny is a huge thing for me. I'm a huge nerd for that stuff. <laughs> yeah. So like, like I can't just like I can't just stick like I can't mix like insects and mammals without like a good evolutionary basis for why that exists. Like centaurs don't exist in Adrian. They just don't because they are a huge middle finger to all of evolution and phylogeny. <laughs> So, um, with Adrian, I went and for the for the races, especially for the races that I have so far, um, I went and well, for most of the humanoid races, it was just a matter of like figuring out where they sit on the human evolutionary tree. But for like the bugbears and the hobgoblins, uh, which are species of the same genus, uh, and for the tabaxi and lizard folk. And the Kenku, which I'll come back to in a moment, they were the most fun. Um, I took a long look at like what they are in D and D canon, and how I can take those designs and basically Darwinize them into, right. you know, into real-ish creatures. And yeah. so with the Tabaxi, um, I was looking through um, the Viverid mammals which are uh a carnivores um and i looked at a bunch of them because in sphera the gnolls are based on binturongs and then i was looking through the viverids and i came across genets and i was like huh those look a lot like tabaxi already so if they just, <laughs> evolved, if they just evolved a humanoid form they'd be tabaxi, so that's what they are canonically, is tabaxi are big humanoid genets. Um, and I've actually worked with, uh, for the for the lizard folk, it wasn't even much of a, a browsing decision for me. It was just like, oh yeah, I've worked with uh, something called a Solomon Islands skink, or a prehensile-tailed skink, and I thought, yeah, that's an arboreal, that's a big fucking arboreal lizard that has a pretty good chance of evolving a really human body shape and there we have the um lizard folk the dragonborn in kobolds um, yeah and... i just re uh, i'm sorry no please sorry i just realized something that i wanted to mention um all right uh real quick i just want to go over no please, kenku. please please the yeah. kenku are my favorite because i was thinking uh i could go the boring old they're just big crows route but then my friends Suggested for owl bears. What if they're big monotremes? Like, Ooh. if you know what a monotreme is, they're the platypi. group that platypi and echidnas belong to. 
And I said, Alex, you're a goddamn genius. And you just gave me an idea for the Kenku. So the Kenku are not birds. They are humanoid monotremes. That's awesome. And they live on this island called Shimura that is basically the Australia slash Madagascar Adrian. Where have, you noticed that the, have, have you noticed that the monotreme family is the family for I don't fucking know why this exists? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. Evolution just looked at monotremes and went, yeah, you fuck off. <laughs> Evolution fan box. Basically. My, uh, my, but yeah, so my... Shimura is the land of the monotremes, and it's going to be really exciting because I have one of the sub-arcs of Death and All His Friends uh, is planned that they go to um, Shimura. That's one of the Ooh. sites that they're going to visit is the big volcano in the center of Shimura. So it's going to be exciting to, to play nice. around with and create creatures for yeah. my uh my thing for monsters is like not so much like the fantasy monsters because temporal does have that but i i couldn't be me if i didn't dive into my roots because the thing the show that made me excited about writing was doctor who and oh, oh, and if there's nice. one thing you can give doctor who is that their monsters when done well are so awesome good. Oh yes. And so that is like some of my favorite parts of story design is like making a good monster. And so as much as throwing goblins was a staple of like the first arc because it was high fantasy, it was a coven of hags, very basic, you know? And yeah. like as an introductory story, I thought that worked. And the same can be said in Ravnik because if I'm using that setting, I kind of want to use creatures that exist on that setting, you know? But as time goes on, especially with arc and also, especially with the Dalem one shot that is happening, because me and Avon couldn't help ourselves. <laughs> um, nope, you're good. You're good. Uh, we made a one shot based on the kid characters that everyone drew, and we want everyone, someone, every each person takes one of them, uh, and then the story happens. And the story is parents are away. There's going to be a party that the kids are throwing. And then they make it into the catacombs, yes. and the catacombs of the castle have. Uh, creatures stored by Caleb's father, uh, the, the evil king. And you, the party, unwittingly unleashes one of them. I won't spoil what it is. But if you spend time in the catacomb before or after you unleash this creature, you can read the notes of the evil king and Caleb's, I guess, addenda to those notes where he tries to document what the hell is underneath the castle. <laughs> and uh, the Doctor Who writer and the SCP lover in me came out to play for uh, Fitzroy's Canacombs. So who, whenever, if anyone gets to play in those... Oh, by the way, Lance, <laughs> I'll cut this too. Avon wanted me to ask you. <laughs> I could send you the DM. Because I was like, Avon goes, Hey, uh, which ones are taken? I'm like, the twins and Nicholas are taken. And she's like, cool, I can't decide between Kensha or, or Rin. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well, whichever is fine. And then they just fucking throw the curveball at me. Oh, I'll pick the one Lance doesn't pick. I'm like, wait, they're playing? <laughs> and then they're like, you're gonna make them. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry in advance. No, Livy is sorry. You're right. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh okay. Uh, so that's a conversation you and Avon need. I've learned that some... as, a, as a DM. Just, okay. I'm Just sorry, okay. but uh, if you want to, the door is open. Okay. There, yeah, that's how I I'll will... play. Uh, okay. Thanks for the heads up. Yeah. I, Avon has kidnapped both of us at this point. <laughs> that is perfectly fine. She does that. She is the shipping queen, and I would not be surprised, like, at she all. Could... She kidnapped us, yeah. Yeah. We're actually both in her basement right now. <laughs> yep. Uh, so the, from the basement? One thing that I'm really looking, like, it's... Is he, okay, so he's not a creature, but Sito is probably one of my most, like, complex homebrew creatures. I can imagine. Yeah. Because uh, I, like, okay... When I first brought Sito into this, he was not supposed to be a player. Like, he was not supposed to be this big of a thing. 
Um, he was but, he was just the ship's AI. Yeah. He was, yeah. He was just the ship's AI, but they're like, nope, we love him. What's he doing? What is he doing? Where is Sito? What's going on with Sito? I'm like, I, uh, mm, okay. That's the but, one thing is the DM that you're not allowed to say is I. <laughs> that is the only thing that DMs are not allowed to say. I don't know. Because you have to know it's your job. Exactly. Right. So I'm just like, uh, but Sito, I based him off of the fighter class. But I had to take, like, Warforge and Fighter, and then I homebrewed a whole bunch of stuff that he can do. Oh, that's fun. But also, later on, are going to be creatures to his extent that are are monsters. That's Hmm. cool. So taking off of like Sito's stuff there's going to be monsters of Sito's status of homebrew and mechanics and all this stuff. Oh god really that's fun. so cool steampunk machinery or not even steampunk but theirs would be more like sci-fi but just evil machines allow you so much fun. One mm-hmm. of my Especially favorite Especially like arcane punk stuff. Yeah one of my is... favorite antagonist machines I ever created was a robot named Dr. Sawbones which, <laughs> I say, which was a medical drone very loosely based off of if anyone remembers the Clone Wars. Yeah. Uh, Star Wars the Clone Wars. Do you remember the episode where like they were in General Grievous's home and there was that little robot that was yes. like, repaired him? Yes. Like the design of the repair robot. But uh his whole deal was he was a surgeon droid until he got a literal just something happened and he messed up a bit. And then his brain equated surgery to rip out someone's heart and put in a sprocket. <clears throat> And then someone, some moron, was like, oh, let's just jettison him out from the space station onto a planet. That'll work. Yep, that's That'll fine. work. And then uh, just sick them on whatever I was dealing with. <clears throat> it was great because it, there was as much fun as enemies with a lot of like moral dichotomy and dilemma are. Sometimes it's evenly fun to throw something at the players or the party where there's like no conscience needed. Like it's an yeah. evil robot, break it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and it's very, it's much simpler than you know building uh, a well-built villain. It like, is. I mean, sometimes it's sometimes you need a well-built villain, especially for like main antagonist status. But oh, like, yeah. like if your big bad evil guy should be a well-built, right? Probably. Like this is again, it's your discretion, but. Probably it, my recommendation is make your big bad evil guy be a good villain, and then just in the meantime, throw whatever the hell you want at your players. They they'll yeah. just have to deal with it. One yeah. of my favorite things is the whole saying of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Oh, that's fun to play with. Yeah. Tenuous to, alliances when it comes to big bad evil guys like that may may come up a little bit later but that's that's one of my favorite like like you thought this person was the bad guy but hey hey, wouldn't it be a shame if there was an even worse person oh boy i love that i love pulling that shit i pulled Uh, that with the order of the red eye in a very like uh uh-huh sort of way but i enjoyed it and in the first arc where Caelan was like I'm sure the hags are the extent of it. And a uh, minor spoiler alert, but by the time by the time this is up, I won't need to cut it. Um, <clears> that the very end, the final hag is just like, you're an idiot if you think I'm the strongest person in this conglomerate. And Caleb's just like, damn it. Oh, <laughs> damn it, I've been called out. <laughs> you guys, I gotta jump off, but this is yeah. super fun. It was. Okay. Right.
I'm Sito, the AI aboard the Miss Lily. I'm sorry to interrupt your regularly programmed podcast, but I wanted to tell you about my family who star in the 20 Sided Adventures podcast, a D&D 5e space opera. You have Captain Botches. What? Are you recording, Sito? He's a good guy, but he needs to work on his hugs. Hey! There's Nora. Yes? Do you need something, Sito? She's a beautiful princess who can kick butt. Aw, thank you! And Daythorn. Hmm? Ready for a story, Sito? Oh! She's super smart and reads lots of books. You can catch our space adventure right now and then every Wednesday starting in March. Okay, gonna start without you. Ah, uh, coming! Are we reading about the lost ones?